attention. We're going to be in Ruth. Um, I'm not going to waste any time, though. We're going to be in the book of Ruth this morning. I'm teaching it on Sunday nights, but I'm telling you, Ruth is full, ladies and gentlemen. It is a mine that is full of gold. It is a mine that is full of extremely precious, highly valuable jewels. And I'm telling you, it's, it's worth every bit of digging that you'll do. Um, it's just so good in how it leads us to Jesus and to, to see God's plan and how he's in control, to see it before it comes about, just all those wonderful things. And so I am on mainly on Sunday nights dealing with Ruth more from a prophetical standpoint, okay? Looking at its prophetic significance this morning, I'm going to look at it more practically, okay? Because I was struggling this week, and I'm like, God, what am I going to preach? And he's like, read Ruth again. I said, thank you, Lord. I get it now. So, it's full, and I'm excited. So much to learn. And let me ask a question, though, before we get rolling. Is there anybody here, don't raise your hand, okay? This is something I want you to answer in your own heart. But is there anybody here this morning that is struggling with whether or not God loves them? I mean, really, just in your own heart, are you struggling with whether or not God loves you? I'm sure that if you're not there today, that at some point in your life you've struggled. I have, not afraid to admit it. I have had times in my life, I've just wondered, in light of where I was, in light of decisions that I was making, I've wondered, God, do you really love me? Do you really love me, God? How can a person overcome this type of struggle? Answer, the truth. Because if somehow in your mind you're thinking, God don't love me, that's a lie. I'm here to tell you that. I don't care who you are, where you've been, where you are today. I mean, the world may not see it, but you literally may have walked in here with just the junk and the dirt and the nastiness of sin all over you in your mind. And you may feel like the most unworthy person there ever was. But how does a person overcome a struggle like this one? The truth. Ruth is the ultimate love story. Not just between Ruth and Naomi, but also between Ruth and Boaz. But it also points to an even greater love. The love of the Father and the story of his redemption literally hidden in the book of Ruth. So I want to give you three points today. Three statements or three whatever you want to call them, okay? That's how people are supposed to preach, right? Three points, a poem, a prayer, and you're done. Go home, right? So today you're getting all of that, all right? Number one is we're going to focus on the statement of his love. The statement of his love. Every detail, i got to say this, every detail, everything is there in this text by God's design. I mean every last bit of it. The more I study God's word, the more that I am blown away by it. None of it is there by accident. Do you agree with me? Say amen. It's intentional, strategic. It's all put together in a beautiful way by our maker. So now, as we read the first chapter, a little bit of it, I want you to notice a few details, okay? Let's start at verse 1. It says, It came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to dwell in the country of Moab, he and his wives and his two sons. The name of this man was Elimelech. The name of his wife, Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to the country of Moab and remained there. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. Now they took wives of women of, the Mo of Moab. The name of the one is Orpah, and the name of the other is Ruth, and they dwelt there about ten years. Then both Malon and Kilion also died, so the woman survived her two sons and her husband. So, let me highlight a few details so far. Because I, I'm willing to ask, how many of you have seen God boldly state his love in these few verses? Some of you are like, oh, I don't think I quite saw that, you know? Because it doesn't say John 3, 16, for, for God so loved the world. That is a bold statement. But I'm telling you, there is a bold statement of God's love in the verses we just read. So let me give you a few details. Number one, the first detail is when the judges ruled. This took place, Ruth, this story took place in the time when judges ruled. So if you're a good student of the Bible, you'll go back and you'll think about the time when judges ruled. 
It was a very spiritually dark time in Israel. Judges 17 verse 6 says it was a time when every man did what was right in his own eyes. Sound familiar? Sound similar to another a nation? But every man was doing what was right in his own eyes. Judges chapter 2 talks about how they were forsaking the God of Israel and worshiping the Baals, worshiping the gods of the pagan nations. So in the time when judges ruled, it's a very spiritually dark time. The Bible says in verse 1 there was a famine in the land. Most likely the famine exists because of the decisions of Israel. The famine happened as a result of God's discipline on his people because they turned their backs from him. And so in love, he's providing discipline for them to get back to reality. Amen? Hopeless times. Impossible times. So let me ask you something. Why does the Holy Spirit choose to give us these details? Why would the Holy Spirit give us these details? Because what he wants us to understand, one of the many things, is that in spite of man, God is at work. And that's where you're supposed to say amen, all right? If you're listening. Some of you done drifted off in la-la land already, but seriously, man, in spite of man. I mean, you look at the book of Judges and you study what's going on in the life of Israel. Everybody's doing what's right in their own, not God's eyes. I mean, you take America, for, for example. I mean, why not just wipe America off the face of the planet? I mean, look to which the lows that we have now stooped in America as a nation. Why not just wipe them off the face of the planet? Why not just get rid of Israel in light of what they're doing? What the Holy Spirit wants you to see and me to see is that in spite of man, God is still graciously at work. So this is a very bold statement of his love. What is he doing? What is God doing? He's at work fulfilling his plan of redemption, fulfilling his promises, the promises that began in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Go read it. The promise of Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, where God said to Abraham, through your seed, I'm blessing the whole world. And that seed is Christ, according to Paul. So he's telling Abraham hundreds of years before Jesus ever shows up, I'm blessing the world through Jesus. So God's fulfilling his plan, his promises, in spite of mankind. And ladies and gentlemen, that is a bold, bold statement of his love. Would you not agree? Even though you don't see it here, these verses are telling us God so loved the world. That he's giving his only begotten son so that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. I'll never forget uh, ministering to a man at the church that I previously pastored who had a wife who cheated on him several times. Now you guys can make light of this all you want, but, but I don't make light of it. But his wife had cheated on him several times, and I remember one day, literally, in my, I just asked him point blank. I said, man, why in the world are you staying with this woman? Because me, along with everybody else, is thinking in our minds, you just need to drop her, and you need to move on. <laughs> That's what we're all thinking. But with tears in his eyes, I mean crying uncontrollably, he looks at me and he says, because I love her. I'll never forget that. Because I experienced a, a sense of love between two people that I don't, well, not be between him and her, that I don't think I had ever experienced in my life. Because everyone around this guy, including myself, and I'm ashamed to admit it, was thinking, trash this woman and move on. He couldn't and he didn't because of the magnitude of his love for. Ladies and gentlemen, the same is with God. Are you with me? Common sense tells God, why God are you messing around with these people? Yeah, you made these promises, okay, just like we do. Yeah, I know, God, you made those promises, but how many of you are in here would say that I'm so glad God doesn't work like we do? 
He makes promises that he sticks to. And because of the greatness of his love in spite of us, he's going to fulfill them. He's going to fulfill them. So I want you to think about your life. I mean, at one point, without Christ, we're spiritually dead, ladies and gentlemen. Lost sheep. Never going to find the way. Never going to find the way unless the Son of Man comes and seeks and saves that which is lost. Unless the shepherd goes after the sheep, they're going to forever be lost. Are you with me? So if you're saved here, your parents are not to praise. You're not to be praised. The church is not to be praised. But I'm telling you, at the end of the day, the one to get all the praise is the one who left heaven as the great shepherd and came and found you. That's the one that deserves all the praise. I mean, praise God for using parents and people and all those things that he uses in our lives, but all he's doing is using them as instruments to do his work. And even as a child who is so selfish and rebellious at times, He promised that when he came in, he's staying, and he's not going anywhere. It's the statement, the, the statement of his love. But then there is, secondly, the response to his love. Okay, so look at the text again. So I got to say something. This is so cool. Spiritually dark times, right? But in verse 1, there was a certain man that the Holy Spirit highlights, Elimelech. You know what Elimelech means? Let's walk through it. El means what? God. Melech means king. And so Elimelech's name means God is king. So I don't know about you, but I was reading that, and I'm thinking, Lord, in spite of spiritually dark times, God is king. Amen? He is king. In spite of the spiritually dark times in America, God is king. He is king. Nothing's going to change that. So here they are. Elimelech, he leaves his hometown where there's famine. He goes to Moab, takes his wife Naomi. He takes his two sons. And, of course, as you know, Elimelech in the process dies. She's left with her two sons. And so her two sons take wives from Moab, which is very interesting. And uh, it ends up that those two boys die. But the women survive. And one of those ladies is named Ruth. So enters Ruth. So let's read a little bit about her. So she arose and her daughters-in-law that they might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people by giving them bread. Now, another interesting fact, Bethlehem is where Elimelech and Naomi are from. Bethlehem means in Hebrew, house of bread. Isn't it interesting that from the place, the house of bread, came the bread of life? Not to satisfy man physically, but to satisfy him forever spiritually. Just an interesting thought. Therefore, she went out from the place where she was, her two daughters-in-law with her, verse 7, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah, and Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go return each to her mother's house, and the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with, with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest each in the house of her husband. So she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, Surely we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there still sons in my womb that they might be your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope... If I should have a husband tonight and should bear sons, would you wait for them until they were grown? Would you restrain yourselves from having husbands? No, my daughters, for it grieves me very much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices, wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, Look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sin after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, entreat me not to leave you. Now listen to these words. Probably some of the most beautiful words ever penned in the Bible. Seriously, think about it. Ruth says, entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. 
Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die. And there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me and more also if anything but death parts you and me. And when she saw that she was determined to go with her, she stopped speaking to her. So enters Ruth. And what in, Ruth serves for you and I today is a twofold demonstration. One demonstration of the love of God, but then on the other hand, a demonstration of love for God. Okay? So she's kind of this twofold demonstration for us. In the sense of the love of God, we see that in how she was committed to Naomi. Do you see that? I mean, she is a demonstration literally of God's commitment to us, to his people. I mean, it's interesting of how Naomi really serves as a type of Israel. I mean, if you look at Israel now, they as a whole don't acknowledge that Jesus is their Messiah. But yet, has God turned his back on them? Absolutely not. Is God going to turn his back on them? Absolutely not. So on one hand, she is a demonstration of the love of God. Now, I want you to read that and do it on your own. Let it be a time of worship for you and read those words that Ruth spoke to Naomi and read them as if God is speaking them to you. Because the bottom line is God has chosen because of your faith to cling to you and he's not going anywhere. He's not going anywhere. Not even death is going to cause that. Matter of fact, death is just going to make it much sweeter because at the moment of death in this life, guess what? You're going to be face to face with him. And that's going to be some good times. But she also serves as a demonstration of love for God. Because what you do is you see her willingness to forsake everything and go with Naomi. What a demonstration, what a picture of the faith that God is looking for. What a picture of it. That we too would be willing to, because you've got to realize, Moab was Ruth's hometown. I mean, she was an idol worshiper there. They most likely worshiped the God of Kamash, I guess is how you pronounce it. I mean, what a picture. And isn't it interesting for those of you that they are Bible scholars, you like to dig a little deeper, isn't it interesting that Naomi is actually the one that introduces the Lord in some way to Ruth, who is a Gentile, picture of the church. So you can dwell on that a little bit later. We'll talk more about that tonight. But Ruth forsakes all to go after Naomi. She chose to give up those false gods, chose to give up her people to follow the one true God of Naomi. And ladies and gentlemen, I believe this serves as a demonstration of the kind of faith that God is looking for in us. Think about it. Think about these thoughts for a moment. The blessing that comes to Ruth was not the result of her goodness. Rather, it was the result of her faith. Think about that. I mean, the goodness that befalls her, I mean, think about it. She's an idol worshiper. I mean, how does she go from the outside to the inside? It's through faith. How does the blessing of God ultimately fall on her? It is not the result of her goodness. She had nothing to offer. Rather, it was her faith that was blessed of God. A foreigner by birth... Ruth, through faith, becomes a part of God's family. There's a lot of great prophetic significance here, but keep that in your mind. A foreigner by birth, yet through faith, becomes a part of God's family. It was only through faith that this Gentile was able to enjoy Boaz and his redemption. Now, we didn't read that part, but I want you to keep that in mind if you read further. It was only by faith that Ruth was able later 
to enjoy Boaz, who is a type of who? Come on, somebody just, he's the kinsman redeemer. Who do you think he's a type of? Jesus. This is the only way she ever gets to enjoy Boaz and the redemption that Boaz provides. It's through her faith to follow hard after Naomi. So, what a beautiful picture there. Ruth's faith led to being the great-grandmother to King David, who was the ancestor, or makes her an ancestor to David's greater son, who is King Jesus, Jesus, the kinsman redeemer of all of God's people. I want you to think about this too. Because what this does, it highlights the response of God's love. In other words, yes, God so loved the world. Yes, God has provided Jesus, the Redeemer of the world. So what kind of response is he looking at? Looking for Ruth is that demonstration. It's a response of faith. Are you with me? God's not looking for you to offer up your goodness and say, I'm going I'm to try to be the good old boy of the South. God's not looking for that. He's looking for you to put your faith completely in his provision, in his plan of redeeming you. Forsake all other plans. Forsake any other God that you may worship to follow him. That is the response of love. It's not, oh God, I'm going to do better today. (laughs) Because that will never happen. You'll fail. It's a response to believe and to embrace his plan. Now think about this. Ruth, a foreigner by birth, now through faith, a member of God's family, which really, by the way, was, uh, was not allowed due to the law according to Deuteronomy. Okay, according to Deuteronomy, a a Moabite nor a Canaanite could come into the family of God, to the congregation of the Lord. But I'm telling you, what the law cannot do, hey, grace can do it. Amen? I mean, we've talked about that over and over. The law is never, it can't give you life. Only thing that the law can do is kill you (laughs) and show you you need the Savior. But what the law couldn't do, grace did. And I'm so grateful for that. But let me finish. Ruth, a foreigner by birth, now through faith, a member of God's family. And think about this. She's a member of God's family to bring Christ to the world. Is that not a beautiful thought? A foreigner by birth, now through faith, a member of God's family to bring Christ to the world. Who are you? What does Ephesians say about you? You were a foreigner. You were alienated from the very life of God. But now, God, through Jesus, has opened up the door for all who will to come into his family by faith. For what purpose? To bring Jesus to the rest of the world. What a picture of the church, ladies and gentlemen. What is your response to love? To get up on Sunday mornings and show up at church? No, God has laid upon you a bigger assignment, and that is he saved you, redeemed you to bring Christ to the rest of the lost world. He put Christ in you so that literally people could see Christ through you. But yet we continue to hold on to this, well, I go to church. Well, I give my money to the church. I go to this. I go. I mean, guys, there's so much more. I'm not ripping it, but listen, there's so much more. And so you're sitting there and you say, I don't know if I can bring people to Christ. I don't know how to do all that. Let me ask you a question. If you really love the world, why are you not figuring it out? Because see, you're looking at somebody that, hey, I don't don't want to talk about it anymore. I'm not going to stand here and brag about what I'm doing. But I'm telling you, my life is devoted not only to just bringing Christ to the world, but also building people who will also go out and take Christ to the rest of the world. And I'm going to spend hours doing it. Hours doing it. Because if we really care about people dying and going to hell, yes, we will want to share Christ with others, but we will also want to make sure that when we're dead and gone, that there are going to be people behind us who can do the same, right? I mean, hey, let me ask you a question. What if the future of the church depends totally upon you? Is it going anywhere? Are you reproducing? Are you multiplying? Is anything happening? You say, well, man, preacher, you're kind of laying a burden on us. Exactly. You weren't given grace to sit around on your laurels and just sit around and say, oh, God, thank you for blessing me. No, God blessed you so you could bless the rest of the world. And God didn't just save you so you could pay for somebody else to be a blessing, by the way. 
Are you hearing what I'm saying? God didn't save you just so you could pay for somebody else to be a blessing. Christ is in you, and he wants to live through you. So let me challenge you to embrace God's purpose of your life for the world, to bring Christ to them. But there are challenges to this, are there not? Let's be real. There are challenges. Look quickly. The last few verses, it says, The two of them went until they came to Bethlehem, and it happened when they came that all the city was excited because of them. And the woman said, Is this Naomi? But she said to them, Do not call me Naomi, call me Mara. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home again empty. Why do you call me Naomi since the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has afflicted me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of Moab, now they came. Now notice this detail. Y'all got to bear with me on this. I am just about done, but you cannot miss this. Notice how this finishes. Now they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. I mean, if you've been paying attention with me, I mean, honestly, if you just look at the physical story, there's not a whole lot good going on up to this point. I mean, man, everything is spiritually dark. There's famine in the land. People are dying everywhere. And we're not only that, but we're talking about the tribe of Judah, all right? This is the tribe through which the Messiah is coming. So there are just a lot, of not, not a lot of good things happening. But this literally at the end is the first hint of some joy. There are challenges of God's love. That's just the way I'm wording it. Because notice what's happening to Naomi here. You've got to grab this. Please grab this with me. Naomi is having a what? She's having a struggle with her identity. She knows she's Naomi, but she's like, look, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara, which means what? Bitter. Why does she want people to call her Mara? Because in her mind, she believes that God has dealt harshly with her. How many of you ever had a somewhat of an identity struggle? <laughs> Some of you probably had it. You don't realize you did have it. But she really is Naomi, and it's interesting to know that her name, Naomi, means pleasant. It means pleasant. And so she's gotten confused because she's gone from believing she's who she is, pleasant, to believing that she's bitter. So let me ask you something. Why is she struggling? Why is, why is Naomi struggling at this, at this point? Why are you struggling? Because, guys, let me ask you a question. How many of you have gone through things in your life, but from your perspective, you're, in your mind, you're 100% convinced that God is dealing harshly with you? Can I, by the way, throw this in? Naomi's wrong here. Can I get an amen on that? Have you ever read the story of Ruth? Naomi is wrong. God is not dealing harshly with her. As a matter of fact, Naomi, just look around at Ruth, okay? <laughs> but not only that, we've read the rest of it, and we know what's about to happen beginning in chapter 2. God's not dealing harshly with Naomi. God is dealing graciously with Naomi. So why is she struggling? Because, listen, she's looking at life with the wrong lens. She's looking at life from her perspective instead of looking at it from God's perspective because I'm telling you, if she could just back up for a minute and think about all that God has provided and as an Israelite, just thinking about all that God will provide because he made promises, man, would her heart change. Man, would she go back and realize her identity is Naomi and not Mara because as a child of God, you cannot walk around believing that you are bitter when your focus and heart right are fixed on Jesus. You can't do it. But we all struggle. Because why do we do that? Very short. We want to listen to ourselves, and we want to listen to the rest of the stinking world. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm tired of listening to the world. I'm tired of listening to myself that wants to one day say it's okay, the next day say it's not okay. I just want to hear the truth and stand on it, okay? That's what I want to do. 
Because the world's going to lie to you. You'll lie to yourself because sometimes you'll think more of yourself than you ought. And sometimes you won't think as you should about yourself. I want to hear what God says about me. I want to see things from God's perspective. I give it to Naomi. She's right about her circumstances and about God being in control, but she is wrong about God's intention. Because all she's able to see is what's been taken away. Now, come on. Come on. Somebody's got to be hanging in here with me this morning. I mean, man, when we get down and we have these struggles, it's because we want to focus on a lot of times all the things that we don't have. Or something that's been taken away. Whether that's your help, what, no matter what it is. And we want to conclude, oh, God's dealing harshly with me. No, the reality is God is dealing very graciously. But he's doing it in his own timing. You see, grief blinds Naomi from seeing all that God has and is going to do through these circumstances. Ruth is with her. The redemption that God is going to provide. But I will say, this is an ongoing struggle for all of us. Hear me, I'm telling you. I listen to my own voice and my own opinion all too much. I listen to others all too much. Not going to lie to you about it. And the only way I overcome is when I'm willing to hear what God has to say and I'm willing to stand on it. And that's the only way we can walk in victory is to decide we're going to do that and believe it. So the chapter closes by saying it's the beginning of the bar barley harvest. It's the first hint of something joyful. And what's interesting is this, and I want you to hear this. This is something so beautiful at the end of this message. Naomi's circumstances end up leading her to Boaz. And I can tell you from the authority of God's word that every circumstance that you and I go through, it is intended to lead us to Jesus. Read chapter 2, verse 1 real quick. Because in the midst of this identity struggle in the story, guess who shows up? Boaz. Just happens to be the time of the barley harvest. Ruth's going to be there to take care of her mother-in-law. First thing she's going to do is take care of the welfare system. <laughs> Basically. It was created by the law. I mean, the, the owners are going to go through first, and then all the orphans and the widows were allowed to come through at the second part. That's called the law of gleaning. But it's going to be in that field, ladies and gentlemen, that she is going to meet the kinsman redeemer. And I am telling you right now with all of my heart, and I believe this because I know the Spirit has confirmed it in my heart and spirit, that all of the circumstances that we go through in life, God intends to use them to bring us to the feet of Jesus in dependence on him. God loves you in spite of you. He has provided redemption for the world. The response he is looking for is one of faith. Not for your best shot, not for a greater commitment, but for you to put your faith in him and believe that Christ is you. Know that he is in control and that he brings, he uses all things to bring us to our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. But the question for all of us is this. Will we let him love us? Will, he, will we embrace it or will we continue to live the lie that we're unworthy and not worthy of his love and devotion to us and his redemption? Will we continue to hear the gospel like some will, sadly will, and, and continue to believe in their mind that there's no way something this good could be free? That's what they'll convince themselves of. There's no way it can be free. But I'm telling you, the response God's looking for is one of faith. It's never going to change. It's the only way in. There'll never be another way, faith in Christ. But then there's some of us, man, you need to stop struggling today. The struggle will come tomorrow or the next. But at least today, you need to hear what God's saying about you, and you need to stand on it. You need to, you need to stop letting the enemy play these games with you about who you really are. You're Jesus. 
He said, oh, that's crazy. No, I'm in him, and that's who I am. And when God, when I see myself, God wants me to grow to the point that I see him. That's who I am. My identity is in him. Let's pray. Father, I, I am overwhelmed. You know, Lord, at all that you have revealed and shown through the text of your word. and None of it, I believe, is, is by accident. None of it, do I believe, comes from my own understanding or ability, Lord. But it's, it's the Spirit of God who's willing to open the eyes of the blind to see the glory of Jesus. God, there's some here today that have allowed their circumstance to make them a bitter person. I mean, they are bitter, bitter to the core because of what they're going through. So, God, you want them to realize who they are in you. You want them to embrace the identity you have given them. Stop playing these games to realize, God, that you're not dealing harshly, but you're dealing graciously, and that in your timing you will bring it all about, and that your purpose and plan is to use all these things to bring us to Jesus and into a dependent relationship with you. God, help us. Whatever it is you're saying, may we embrace it by faith now. Not giving the enemy time to steal it away, not giving the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, the desires of any, everything else, Lord, to come in and choke it out. God, may we embrace it. Let it go in and ultimately produce fruit to bless the world. In Jesus' name I pray. And all of God's people said, amen. Let's...